Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast for Monday, January 13th, 2020. Greetings, folks, and welcome back to Gig Gab, and Happy New Year to the show that is all about working musicians, because that's what we do here. And here, back in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in San Jose, California, Paul Kent. Happy New Year, Mr. Kent. Happy New Year, Mr. Hamilton. You've, you've had quite a few uh, adventures since we spoke last. I have. That's right. We, um, I guess the last time we spoke was the day before New Year's Eve, so we both had some gigs. Mm-hmm. And then uh, and then I was out at CES and I actually I, I there was some stuff at CES that that was relevant, it, like things actually that I saw there that uh, I'm not going to I don't quite have everything together for it for this episode, but we'll we'll talk about it in a future episode. And then while I was there, I got to see uh, uh, two bands, actually. JBL put on JBL slash Harmon slash now Samsung put on uh, their big party every year or their big party this year that they put on every year. And this year, the musical guest was guests were um, Stevie Nicks played mm-hmm. the the headliner slot with her band. And then opening for them or in the first slot was uh, Pat Benatar and Neil, Neil Geraldo uh, with, you know, with their band uh, plan. And both of both bands were fantastic. I've seen Stevie Nicks in a variety of capacities with, with, um, with Fleetwood Mac a couple of times. And then actually once at that sound city tour that the, that Dave Grohl put together with the Foo Fighters as the backing band, she oh, played, that's right. she played four songs with them. And that actually, I liked her better there than I did, um, than I did with, uh, with Fleetwood Mac. I mean, she's good with Fleetwood Mac, but she gets to be Stevie Nicks when she gets to be Stevie Nicks, you know, does and, she do at least half the show of her, of her Fleetwood Mac hits that she wrote? Oh, for sure. Oh, yeah, 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 no. yeah, yeah. You get you get like the, the song catalog of Stevie Nicks, uh, you know, which which spans everything. Yeah, she doesn't was she doesn't. Um, was Wadi Wachtel her guitar player. Indeed. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. He killed it. Yeah. yeah. And it's such a pleasure to be able to see, you know, bands like this in uh, I mean, it's the club, I think where they do it, it's, it's the joint at the Hard Rock Hotel, which I think at this moment in time might be no more. They're they're tearing down the hard rock and building the Virgin Whoa. hotel. Yeah. But it's, it's like a, I think it would hold 2000 people if they let it. Uh, but for these parties, they limit it to a thousand so that it's, you know, it's full for sure, but not crowded. And, you know, I mean, they, how close to the stage do you go? Um, I usually don't get right up front. I have been before you certainly could, uh, you know, I mean, it gets, it gets a little crowded, but you certainly could get, uh, as close as you want. I've, I've stood right on the rail before, but the, because it's a JBL party, they cover up the speaker stacks or the, the line arrays that are there and they hang JBL speakers and that's what they use for the event. Right. And because of that, the speaker stacks are actually set up wider. The, the line arrays are set up wider than they normally would be in that venue. They kind of put them outside the the uh, the normal ones that are hanging there. And that sort of sets the focal point of a good mix of sound further back uh, in the room. So I there's like it's the way this room is. It's like a floor and then behind the floor are sort of various tiered levels of 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 platforms. And I, I usually stand on the floor, maybe halfway back, uh, which I mean, it's fine. Like I'm really Here's close. Soundboard. To this. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Sort of n- maybe halfway between the the stage and the soundboard. The soundboard is at the back of the of this floor area. I mean, it's a theater, not a not a yeah. not an arena or anything. So. Um, so, yeah. So, I mean, it, 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 it's it's a good sounding room. I just like to be able to hear everything. And so I, I get to where the sound is good. And my view is always fine for for that. Mm-hmm. But um, they both played really well. Neil Geraldo, though, said something very interesting. Um, You know, well, first of all, I realized how much of a partnership Neil Geraldo and Pat Benatar have. I mean, that that they really like the, the musical career we know as that of Pat Benatar really is the musical career of Pat and, and Neil. Like they, right. they have been musical partners since day one. 
And, um, and it worked obviously. And then, and then I think 10 or 11 years into it, they, they wound up, you know, getting married and all that stuff, which is great. Um, but they've written all the songs together, at least most of them. And Neil was going through like all the elements of a good song. And one of them really hit me. He's like, yeah, you know, we, we come up with the, the chorus. We, we, we write the, the lyrics, the melody, you know, all of those things that sort of seem obvious. And he's like, and then we think about the intro to the song because we want our songs to be memorable and recognizable within the first couple of notes. We want you to know what song it is right out of the gate. And he says, and, and if you think about it, all the songs that you know that are by us, you know them immediately. As soon as you hear the intro, it, you know what song it is and, and who it's by. And he's like, that's not an accident. That's intentional. And I thought, man, what a great piece of advice of, you know, like a, a advanced level song craft, right? That you really want to think about the intro. And I mean, you could even apply that in your, in your cover band too, like coming up with the right way to enter a song. I mean, a lot of times you, you start the song like, like they would on the record. And, and of course, many songs uh, intentionally or not start with very recognizable intros. Uh, but you know, that, that um, certainly from a songwriting standpoint, it was like, that really hit me. And with us, you know, focusing a lot more on songwriting now and fling that really resonated. It was like, Oh yeah, that's cool. good thinking. Yeah, I know. It was just one of those things that, you know, that it's interesting to hear, you know, a world-class songwriter like, like him just say, Oh, Hey, here's a tip. It's like, that's a pretty good tip. <laughs> but we, don't, we kind of innately know this because as, as cover band musicians, when you play the first riff of a song often and you get that scream from the audience, you know, you're doing it right. That's it. Yep. So, you know, yes, the hook is important, of course, but you know, are you ever going to get them to the hook? Why not start out, you know, with, with uh, the playing field tilted in your favor. That's so it. Why wouldn't you spend time on the intro? On the intro. Yeah, no, it makes sense. But I, I will say as someone who has been in, many original bands, including some with, you know, varying levels of, of moderate success. Uh, I have never had, we've had that conversation. I remember in go figure, uh, which perhaps not surprisingly is the original band that has had the most success with our originals of any of them. Um, that was a conversation that we had a couple of times. And, and as I was talking about this with my brother, who was in that band with me, but was not, he wrote some of our songs, but he wasn't our chief songwriter. He was talking about our, our other guitar player, Brian Ailes, who, uh, who really just innately knew how to make that, that the intro was important. And sure. a lot of our songs were that way. In fact, those of you that listen to Mac geek gab every week, you hear one of those signature Brian Ailes intros as part of our theme song, uh, and it's no accident that that is our theme song. I always liked the way that song, which is called The Answer, started. So, um, so in fact, you know what? I, I just happen to have theme songs queued up here, so I will play that. Get it. Just, yeah, here you go. Right? Mm. I mean, that's, you know. I almost thought we were getting limelight. Oh, there you go. Well, <laughs> so that's the next topic, my friend. <laughs> Uh, I do. We are going to talk about democracy and song selection because uh, that's a good one. But um, but I, obviously, you know, last week came the news that uh, certainly one of the most influential people for me, uh, both in terms of, of drumming, but but also in many other ways, um, passed away. We learned that uh, what a week ago, oh, Tuesday, we learned this on Friday afternoon, but on Tuesday, Neil Peart. Uh, passed away after a three and a half year battle with brain cancer, glioblastoma. I, I don't know uh, a lot about what he went through because we, he was, he was a very private person and, and didn't that the, the news of this didn't even leak out until they decided uh, for it to come out. But um, as what I know about glioblastoma, most people don't survive more than, you know, 12 to 18 months after diagnosis. And, and he made it three and a half years. So I don't know what kind of treatment he was getting or or, you know, any of the particulars other than what we know here. But um, it's, that's a long time to go with that particular type of cancer. But um, yeah, you know, that the news, it's interesting. I've, I've thought a lot about this and, and I've thought a lot about this conversation. I've, I've been both uh, 
looking forward to it, talking about him and, and also sort of dreading it, uh, not in equal quantities, which is good. But uh, I guess you'd call that anticipation. But um, he um, he was, a you know, we knew that Rush was done playing. Uh, we, we knew that, that they were done touring. He had said as much. The band had said as much. But so so there was, you know, when it, when the news of his passing came, um, it wasn't so much grieving that it was there was always I always wondered why he had not done any more writing. I mean, he used to write on his blog pretty frequently. He wrote many, many travel books, which are fantastic, by the way, even if you're not a, a Rush fan. He just he was a really good travel writer. And um, I thought it was weird that, you know, it's like I figured he would take a year, maybe two after they did their final tour just to, you know, let the dust settle and make sure people knew that, look, the, the band is done. I'm not playing anymore. I am a retired drummer. Like he went out of his way to make sure that message got sent. Sure. And, and then that was it. You know, that's the last we heard from him. And I, I kept, you know, every now and then I think, man, like, where is that guy? I'd check his blog. Like, did I miss a post? Which would have happened, you know, over the years or whatever. And nothing. And I thought, man, I know he's a stubborn, independent dude, but like, what's the deal? Like, I know he, he still is a creative person. He just doesn't like touring. And he also knows that at 70 years old, he might not be able to play the same Neil Peart drum parts that he played when he was you know, 20, 30, 40, and 50. So, I mean, mm-hmm. I, I got it, but it would seem weird. Of course, now with the benefit of hindsight, we, we sort of know why, um, why that it was is. also very selective about how he engaged with the public. I mean, and, 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 you know, behind a blog, he was comfortable, Sure, but meet and greets, he was definitely not comfortable. Right. That's true. Um, you know, I, I, we, and I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to address that, but I'm going to take a long path to get there. Um, he, not that long. He um, he had the nickname the professor from early, early on, and it wasn't until his passing and seeing you know all the posts and and all the articles about him that I realized, you know, we all learned a lot from him, and it not just drumming, right? Like, I mean, yes, he was a, a master technician behind the drums, right? The, you know, the, the the first of his kind of that sort, and influenced countless players because of it. And lots of people, that's that's the only thing they know about him. And, and that's enough. Right. Like he he did that. And I certainly as a as a drummer who was, you know, 14 in 1984, 85, like that, that he was a huge influence on technique for me. And because of that, I learned, you know, more about him and sort of tugged at the thread. And it there was a lot more that he had to teach. Um, he, the composition of drum parts is really the thing that I think mattered even more in that he was able to communicate with that technical ability while still perfectly serving those particular songs. Um, I mean, to be fair, the songs were crafted around the three of them. So of course he had his voice in that, but you know, he never got in the way of the vocals. He always made sure to, uh, increase the complexity of each fill, like the fill between a verse and a chorus. The first one would be, you know, one thing. And then by the end, the, in, the complexity, but the, the energy and the emotion would be more and more throughout the song. And, and that is like, that's harder, I think, than playing the actual parts. And don't get me wrong. His parts are hard to play. Uh, but, but, Playing them is way easier than coming up with them in the first place. And so I, I you know, I learned a lot of, out of, of that from him. But I think the biggest lesson I learned from him was his his dedication to his craft was, you know, obsessive in a in a mostly good way. And there's a lot to be said about that, that, you know, just sort of pursuing Excellence. I don't want to say pursuing perfection. That's nothing you could ever get to, but pursuing excellence and never stopping, uh, I think was a good thing. But there is one lesson from him that I learned sort of in, in, um, in the, the, I I learned the opposite of, of what he preached. And that was this whole thing about meet and greets, you know, that there, he, he summed it up in, in limelight, the lyrics to limelight where he said, uh, whatever he said, uh, I can't pretend a stranger is a long awaited friend. And as a shy, 
you know, teenager that was sort of geeky and, and all of that, like I, I could very easily have taken that to heart. Like, great. That's, there's my excuse, right? Like, I don't have to talk to people that I don't know. I don't, you know, I can just ignore them and I can kind of be rude about it, which is sort of how he was. Um, that's one way to do it, but I don't think that that's necessarily the best way. Um, he said he can't pretend a stranger is a long awaited friend. I think uh, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine and we came up with, or my friend came up with this, but sort of summed it up. He wouldn't, he won't pretend a stranger is a long awaited friend, but you could. And, you know, for someone who intended to make intended and succeeded at making his career in essentially, you know, what we can distill down to the entertainment business. Um, you sort of have to take that along for the ride that there are going to be people, the people that you entertain that support you, that some of them want to, um, appropriately interact with you. Well, that's the thing. I mean, there's a lot of distance between a long lost friend hmm. and just a professional courtesy, right? There's a lot of ground to cover where, you know, someone just wants to say, thank, thank you, you for the great music. That's and it. you just say, you're welcome. You know, it's my pleasure. Something like exactly. that. I mean, exactly. But, but what, I, what I think is he was projecting his fear that that was what was expected to him of him. Yeah, I think I think you're right. I think he was projecting. I think he had a lot of social anxiety that that sure. throughout his life he got over. So maybe for him, that line is true at, at the time that he wrote it. I can't pretend. I mean, that may well have been speaking, you know, at a deeper level, uh, but you know, you you can engage politely with people. Again, there are some people that, that want it to go too far. And in my very, very limited, you know, experience with that kind of uh, fame with people that, you know, listen to our podcasts and stuff. I mean, I've been doing this 15 years. We've been publishing Mac Observer for over 20. Uh, you know, there are, it, it is not rare thankfully it's compartmentalized for me which is great uh but it is there are, there are scenarios where it is not rare that people want to you know they they follow me they listen and they want to interact and i've learned that you know what it's okay um I, you learn some tricks about how to uh appropriate keep keep the distance appropriate some people don't buy you know uh, don't necessarily um see the cues, the social cues that say, okay, we're, this is where the line is and they step over and it's like, okay, then you need to be a little more direct with them. But you can, like you said, politely uh, be great. You can be gracious about it. And, and to be fair, as I understand him, Peart got better and better at that throughout his life. It's kind of, as we all do, you know, wisdom sort of teaches us a lot about ourselves, if nothing else, Sure. you know, but, um, but that was the one thing that, that I, you know, I, as I heard that as a, you know, impressionable youngster, it's like, I don't know that that's the right answer here. And, and as, and as I had the opportunity to, to decide where on that continuum, I, I put myself, it was more on the side of, yeah, I can be polite and gracious. And then, and then I want to go home and hole up. I mean, I am a, a, an introvert. I'm not a shy person uh, anymore. I used to be, but I'm, I'm an introvert. I need my, my alone time. But, but there are moments where it's like, it's okay to acknowledge those people that are truly thankful for the thing that, that you bring for them. So I think, I think with Pert, you know, he was clearly a, a remarkable mind, right? That's oh. where those jump parts came from. That's yeah, where the writing a, came from. He That's made it okay to be an, from. an intellectual. That's right. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, this is the kind of the interesting thing about Rush to me is, you know, Rush on paper doesn't make sense, right? Rush, you know, doesn't doesn't become Rush if you were to understand what they were going to try to do, right? right. You know, in, in, especially in the era that they came out in, right? Yeah. But, you know, to me now, looking back, Rush is kind of an extension of the promise of rock and roll of every man's music. These were just different every men. You know, That's they right. were kind of geeky and nerdy, but they had their own thing to say. They were true to who they were. Very Beatlesque. you know, that the three of those guys found each other. I know it took them one iteration to get to get to the right drummer, but as it, as it the, did with the Beatles. That's true. That's true. Yeah. But, you know, I think that's that's kind of the remarkable gift that Rush gives us and certainly Neil gave us is like, you know, rock and roll music is everyone's music and everybody with a true thing to say 
has got something to contribute to the canon of, of the music that will be left for people. And, and he was just that guy. He was just that guy with that kind of remarkable complex mind that heard remarkable complex jump parts and, and remarkable complex lyrics. But it was, there was a truth and consistency. And then you, you know, the little that they let us know about the band, you saw that they were just dudes, right? You know, they were their own dudes, but they were, they were guys. And there was a relatable aspect to them for many people at different levels. At different, Geeks totally. Yep. Geeks got them at a certain, you know, in an intimate level, you know, mathematicians got them at a certain, you know, intimate level, you know, uh, fans of, of, um, of uh, virtuosity got them at a certain level. And, you know, that was certainly the gift that they gave, but, and actually, you know, I'd like to just pause for a second and say, you know, certainly to all of our listeners who are Rush fans, you know, we feel you. Um, I don't know if I've shared this with listeners before, but one of my best friends from high school was, he was actually best man in my wedding was front of house sound for Rush for many years. I reached out to him and of course he was, you know, intensely, intensely sad. Um, You know, people feel this, and I think that's the mark that he left. I mean, I was amazed at the amount of people that were sharing things on social media. About Isn't him. It, it, so, OK, I, I was waiting to, to say anything. I wanted to get your opinion on that, because obviously being a Rush fan, you know, I know I know there are social media algorithms that expose things for those of us that are interested in them. But it really seemed like I mean, we've certainly seen our share of, uh, you know, rock stars passing in the last few years. But I saw so much more about Neil Peart than I did even about someone like Tom Petty uh, that I thought, wow, this I mean, this guy really even if you weren't a fan of the music, even if it just did wasn't your cup of tea or whatever it was. Everybody had a huge respect for this guy. And I think you're right. I think it's because they they like were fiercely independent about doing things on their own terms. In fact, that was when they went in to record 2112, they were they were at the end of their career. Like the record company was done. They're like, well, you get one more and then and then you're out. And they're like, well, then we're we're going to swing for the fences. We're just going to do our own thing. We're definitely not going to try and copy Led Zeppelin anymore. You know, we're just going to be our own thing. We're not going to try to make another album like the first album right. and whatever happens happens. And, you know, as it turns out, this is what happened. Uh, yeah. And, and, you know, Neil was famous for saying that he, uh, he I'm going to paraphrase. He wanted to make, he wanted to do things that his 16 year old self would be okay with. I, that worked for him. And I, and I grok what he was saying there. I feel like that's a little bit dangerous to take literally, but uh, but you know, certainly for him, it, it worked in the right way. I think he took it in a healthy way that, you know, he wanted to stay true to his values and not sell out and not do any of those things. And and certainly he and and Rush as a band did. And I think you're you know, you said that they're just good guys. The fact that this guy who who has fans that are rabid. Right. I mean, like you know, following everything they possibly can about him. And in this world of information permeating everything, the fact that he had brain cancer for three and a half years and no one found out about it, yeah. like it did not leak out. Obviously his his friend, some of his friends have, have written about it. It would not surprise me. I'm not asking, but it would not surprise me if your friend Brad w- was in that circle. I don't know how tight he was with them, but I mean, it, it like people like him have since come out over the weekend and said, yeah, thankfully, you know, we can talk about this. And, you know, thanks to all the people that, that, uh, that understood when I couldn't answer questions and that sort of thing. But the fact that, I mean, you know, it, all it takes is one offhanded comment by someone that doesn't respect that trust. And that's it in today's world. That's all it takes for the news to get out. And three and a half years went by and nothing. And and three and a half days went by after he passed with nothing. I mean, that's both of those things are really a testament to to like you said to that that bond that they built with some with themselves and and with you know the guys at work the people around them and and all of that i think that's yeah it's good it's good it's sad Neil. yeah i did get to i don't want to say i i get to meet him but i did get to encounter him once <laughs> uh when i was <laughs> when i was in college uh, my friend Adam and I, I was at the college, co- at the university of Connecticut, which is about a half hour from Hartford, Connecticut, half hours drive. And Rush was playing in Hartford 
And we thought we'd already seen him once on the tour, but it was like, well, we got to go see him again. So we're like, well, you know, we're broke college students, so we should try and like get free tickets or something. And so we, uh, this was, you know, early nineties or whatever. We had access to the laser printer on the school campus. So uh, Adam and I went down and printed up these little things that we put in. We, we, we printed up paper and then went to the pharmacy and bought like little name tags. And we printed up badges that said we were from DNA, Dave and Adam entertainment. Uh, and we put our names on them and, you know, we showed up at the backstage door uh, pre-show, but I don't know, maybe an hour and a half before showtime or something. And uh, said to the security guy, oh, you know, DNA entertainment over at the University of Connecticut. And we got to do a thing. And, and the guy's like, yeah, OK, go on. Uh, you know, tour manager's office is, is the fourth one on the right or something We're like, oh, holy crap. Like, OK, it worked. So we get to the tour manager's office, Howard Ungleiter, and we knew who he was from, you know, being students of, yeah. the, of Rush. Yep. And uh, and uh, and we stood by his office and and then it was like, um, well, now what do we do? Like. That we got to Now we got to tell this guy who knows that we're not on his list that we're on his list. So I was like, I guess we'll tell him that. So we're waiting for the door to open because we didn't want to, you know, we could hear him talking to people in there. We're like, well, we don't want to be those guys. So we, you know, patiently waited our turn. Door opens and out comes Getty Lee. And I was like, hey. And he was like, hey. And he w walked on. And then so we're sort of in shock that like, oh, OK, this is how this works backstage. Great. OK. And we're sort of trying to process that. And, you know, we went from Getty Lee, who was much, much shorter uh, than either of us, to uh, the next person walking out the door, which was Neil Peart, who was much, much taller than me. And I, I you know, stood at 6'3 in those days. Yeah. And uh, and it was like, uh, hey. And he was just like, hi, and moved on, <laughs> you know, in typical. I mean, the, his reaction was was not at all surprising to either of us that he was not as happy to see people he didn't know or interact with people he didn't know. And, and it was obvious we were, you know, part of the, the riffraff as, as it were. And, you know, he was probably in his focused pre-show mindset as I'm sure he always was and, and all of that. So we did get to encounter him. I don't want to say we got to meet him or anything, but, uh, but yeah, there, there was that. So, <laughs> which was probably cool. a perfect encounter. That's right. Yeah, that was that was the length of time where he was not furious with us. So that was good, I guess. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So thank you, Neil, for for all the lessons that, that you uh, taught and left behind for us. Um, it means a lot. So, yeah. The uh, the next thing that I want to do. Is talk about our sponsor, Chauvet DJ. You know, you look good when people can see you. And Thank you me. look even better when people have fun lights to look at. Like, remember to think about that. Lights are not just about lighting up your face, although that's important. Lights are about setting a mood. And lights even themselves can be something interesting for people to look at if you put them in such a place where they light things up. So you put some lights behind the band, you put some lights in front of the band. Uh, some of them serve one purpose, some of them serve the other, and both of them serve that sort of ambient purpose when they all work together. And this is the beauty of what Chauvet DJ does, because Chauvet DJ lights are built for exactly the kinds of things we all do here. They're not just for DJs. Lighting is for anyone performing on stage that audiences want to see. And Chauvet DJ is built to make controlling your lights super easy. Their LED products have multiple control options, including auto programs and sound activation modes. They've got wireless foot switches, perfect for guitarists, and other remote control options. In fact, Chauvet DJ includes Bluetooth so that you can control everything right from your phone or your tablet or someone else can control things from their phone or their tablet, right? So you can offload that without needing to run wires from the stage to the back of the room. This kind of thing can work really well because they've got their free BT Air app that's available for both Apple and Android devices. So you got to check this out. Go to Chauvet DJ, C-H-A-U-V-E-T-D-J.com, or just click on the link at giggabpodcast.com and check it out because you want to use, we use them in fling. We use Chauvet DJ stuff. We've been using them for I don't know, probably almost 10 years now. I mean, it, there's stuff in it. And when we have the same stuff that we bought 10 years ago and it, you know, we, we bring it to gigs and throw it in cars and buses and all that stuff. And it, it, you know, it, it, it's built to last. So 
you got to check it out. ShoveDJ.com and our thanks to Chauvet DJ, of course, thanks for sponsoring Chauvet. this episode. Yeah. House Rockers endorsed as well. You got, yeah, it's great stuff, man. Great stuff. So, yeah, it's good. Hey, um, a, one P, a PSA before we get into this thing about uh, democracy and song selection. Beware giving audience members access to a cowbell. Uh. Dude, we played. So I played two gigs on New Year's Eve. The, the, at midnight, of course, we played uh, Rocky Horror, as I, as I said. That, that went really well. Really well, in fact. Um, earlier that night, we played a gig uh, Uptown Celebration was the Wii played a gig at my friend Gary, our guitar player's restaurant. And it was a tiny little thing. Gary made me use his electronic drums. I wanted to use my pitch slap. He was against that because he didn't understand how great that would have been. So anyway, low volume, but fun gig. And it turned into a pretty, mm, you know, sweaty, raucous kind of thing because it was New Year's Eve, 7 to 9 p.m. P- people were out ready to party and, and all that. So it was fun. And we had a blast and everybody loved it. And even I got over playing Gary's crappy electronic drum kit, but it's fine. <laughs> well, I mean, he's just got one for rehearsal. It's not like he has some, you know, performance ready one. The pads are not, they don't feel like drums. It's just weird, you know, but it's fine. I mean, it worked out. It was all good. Uh, we finish the gig. Like we said, we were going to play from seven to nine. Great. It's nine Oh five. We finish a song, whatever song we did. It was enough. You know, it was like, it felt like the end. Great. Gary turns to me and he's like, you want to sing one? I'm like, nope, don't need to. I'm good. And then he starts, uh, what I like about you from the romantics. I'm like, oh crap. Okay. So as soon as he starts it, like before I even come in, this woman who had been enjoying her drinks all night, uh, grabs a cowbell and starts hitting it with nothing to do with the four, four time in which Gary is playing. And then once I come in, I thought, okay, well she'll, she'll normalize in. No, no, that's not what happened. Um, there, there was no normalization. It was like this weird, like 12, eight against five, four time thing happening. That would be, that would be far too much credit that you're giving to someone, right? Yes. They're not, they're not counting five, four. No, so they're not counting anything. It was like an 11, 14 kind of thing. And I don't even know how you get there. The math doesn't even work, but she figured it out. Like she, outdid Frank Zappa on this one. And so, and it was loud because the gig, vo- you know, our stage volume was low. There were no drums. It was just, and I was hearing drums, not in my ears. It was just out of PA speakers that were far away from me. Right. So I'm hearing drums from far away. I'm hearing cowbell from much closer and trying to sing. And then mid song things, she wasn't the only one enjoying her drinks. Somebody else ran into our singer Marty's mic stand, which had his iPad on it. So singing, playing and ignoring the cowbell. Suddenly I have his iPad flying in front of me, which I put a hand up and caught and put it down. Oh, it was a total for you. man. I know my, my my wife and, and, and son were there and they're like, we've never seen anything like that. <laughs> like, you know, I didn't even think about it in the moment. It was just like, well, there's an iPad. So I might as well grab that, put that over here while I'm doing this and singing that and trying to hold everything together and all that stuff. I was so there's happy a, when that song ended. <laughs> there's a guy around here who, when I met him about five or six years ago, he, I don't know whether he gave him out or he just encouraged his fans to bring tambourines to his gigs. And, you know, whereas... Whereas a cowbell is one tonality, yeah. you know, you know, talk about something that cuts through everything acoustically, you, tambourines, it, the most cloying, annoying thing. I mean, I play at a coffee shop and the coffee grinding machines go. I mean, having some kind of residual noise when you're performing is a possibility in a lot of Always. places, right? Yeah. But man, tambourines all in different semblances of rhythm are just the most annoying. Oh, things. Yeah. I mean, literally you'd have to avoid this guy's gigs. You know, he did it because he wanted to get people involved in a show, I guess. Sure. sure. But um, whew, that was, that was a tough things to listen to. They are, it's that's tough. I agree. Yeah. Tambourines are dangerous. Yeah. I don't know who brought this box of percussion toys and why it was placed within, uh, you know, reach of and eyesight of the crowd, but it was a bad decision. So bad there's my decision. PSA for all of you. Just I, I probably didn't even need to share that. It was more important just to share the story, <laughs> I guess, because yeah. we all know you should not give the audience cowbells, um, even though we've probably all done it at one time or another. 
All right. Uh, on to Tom. We promised this last year. We didn't get it. We couldn't fit it in last year. So here we are this year. And I will remind you all that, you know, the beginning of a decade does not necessarily define a decade. And and the way I I, I want to highlight that is the first song on the first album of the 1980s was Rush's The Spirit of Radio. So that did mm. not define a decade by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> all right. Um so democracy and songwriting is the topic. Yeah. Tom writes, uh, continuing on the song selection thread, what are your thoughts on selections made where everyone has equal input? In one of the bands I play in, everyone brings songs to the table. My thought is to play to our strengths, i.e. a strong vocalist with a range geared towards alternative and classic rock with an eye on the popular songs in that genre. So that's Tom's band. He says uh, one of the other guys bases his decisions on y the number of plays that a song has on YouTube. If it has a lot of plays that therefore it is popular and would go over well, regardless of our band. He says, case in point, he once brought a Taylor Swift song to the table. I'll state here. We are not a band that should be covering Taylor Swift. So I'll appreciate your input on this. So thank you. So, Dave. So, Paul. I'm living this right now, so I have some very, very salient uh, reflections on this topic, and that's why I've been chomping at the bit yeah. to get to it. So, I, I would say that there, I would say that we this is no small this plays no small part in Fling's uh, decision to accelerating Fling's decision to focus on originals. Mm. Yeah, because you couldn't get to to comprehensive uh, tacit agreement on the process of adding cover songs. It was going in the opposite direction. We, it. we had it. it for a long time. And, and then it started to, to fracture, which is a normal thing. I will say I've seen it in other bands and there are many ways to approach it when that happens. And this is one of them. And it, and it was, it would have been a natural progression for us to get back to originals anyway. This just yeah. helped accelerate it. So it's, I mean, it's, it's great. I, this is, there is no bad blood here. Like I'm really excited about this, but, but this cool. definitely played a role. So yeah, there you go. All right. So I'm going to share a story. And if anybody out there in podcast land wants to follow along, the first thing I could tell you is write on your whiteboard, on your, on your ideation board, in big letters, goals, G-O-A-L-S, goals. I think it really comes back to that. And so here's my story. Uh, when I started the House Rockers, I started it. Yeah. I put together the band. I went and got everybody. It was my vision. I did all the work. And um, But I told people pretty clearly, you know, I'm going to make the song decisions. And, uh, you know, I have a vision for what this band's going to be, how it fits in with the other bands, you know, yada, yada, yada. Sure. Time goes on. And I add someone else who's going to be a singer. And after about a year, um, they say, well, listen, you want my emotional buy-in. I should be able to pick the songs I'm going to sing. And right at that moment was one big crossroads because I was about to let go of some creative control and vision, singular vision, in the interest of keeping a band together. Right? Good, good player. You know, good guy. Yeah. And I wanted him. And so right there and then – was a decision. And I, I'd been through enough players. We were starting to get some, some momentum and we were starting to get some traction. And, you know, did I want to start all, all over again with a, you know, and, and find someone to replace that spot? Sure. And no. And, point, and that, the like there's that, that's, that's arguably the best reason uh, for this kind of, of thing to open up, right? You, you want everybody to be involved. And so, okay. Like, well, what are your, well, I'm gonna what pause are your you there strengths? Because we're going to end right back up. I know. You and I, we're going to end in that same place where we often end, which is the leader, you know, the, the, the democracy perspective versus the autocracy or the benevolent dictatorship. Perspective, sure. Right? Sure. All right. So I, I made that decision, opened it up. He selected some songs that were, even though not my cup of tea worked for him. I said, I'm going to make this, you know, let the rain out. And I, I would say more than not, the selections worked for us, but definitely I, I carry with me like, ugh, you know, there's there, there would be songs that would be like, ugh, that's not good for us. You know, that's not that's not who I want to be. Right. And so as a leader, now I'm starting to kind of collect a little bit of baggage. I'm kind of collect like, man, I'm doing all the work. 
but I've given up some of the creative control, but I'm still doing all the work. So th- th- I'm, I'm only adding that because that is, I think, a fairly common. I don't think I'm unique as a guy who had a, an idea for a band, put together a band, you know, and did the booking, does the accounting, does the marketing, does the, you know, all that stuff. Right. And then, you know, has to deal with how much they're going to be okay with as they kind of give away creative control. Yeah. So time goes on Add another good player. Who's a good singer. And we want to include them. We want them to him to feel, you know, connected, same type of thing. He chooses some songs for himself. It um, seemed person, like a good idea at the time. I get it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it seemed like a necessary idea, right? <laughs> you know. You're choosing, you're choosing yeah. momentum and continuity. Yes. Over control. Right. Fair. Yeah. All right. So to this point, you know, many, many years into the band, the singers are choosing songs that they feel well every once in a while in a conversation, someone will offer something else. And if the light bulb goes on for the singer, they might take that on fully knowing that that's, you know, a good thing. You want to make your bandmates happy if you can, if you can. Right. right. So now we progress. And now I have another band member who who's in the band who says, you know, I would like some creative input. I want to feel like I'm, um, I'm contributing creatively. Sure. And I'm like, well, you don't sing. He goes, I know, but, you know, listen to my ideas. And I think I should be able to, to offer some input. And I'm again, I'm at the same point where I'm like, should I you know, let this out or, you know, should I clamp it down? Yeah. And uh, the ideas were, oh, well, we actually got two good songs out of the idea. So, again, I am aware enough that I'm battling my own inertia. Right. I'm right. My own right. my own biases. But I also need to be aware, you know, if we get some wins at it, we got one song out of the ideas that we play every night and goes over, you know, fairly well. Uh, we got one song that was was pretty good and we played most of last year, but, you know, I haven't really brought it back. Sure. Anyway, then now we come to this year and the response is, well, I think everybody should be able to submit ideas. Um, and, you know, I'm at the place where, hmm. Yeah. Well, the horse is out of the barn, right? Right. And the way it's kind of pitched to me is like, well, you don't have to take the ideas, but let everybody in the band, 10 piece band, submit three songs and who of the three singers we have would sing them. And then it's up to the singers if they want to take those songs on. But you've given everybody a voice, a democratic chance, a voice, and, you know, an opportunity to contribute. Yep. And then we actually took it a little further that one of the singers said, well, let's have some fun with it this year. And let's let the singers suggest three songs each for the other two singers. So you don't choose anything for yourself this year. Oh, that's interesting. Sure. Interesting enough. Right. Yeah. So well, we again, go through this process with the, with the right thing. Like it, we wound up at that point, sort of, we evolved to that point gradually with the Macworld all-star band where, where we would start. Like I remember Chris Breen suggested uh, that I sing U 2s desire. I would never have chosen that song for myself. It's like, well, that's a big thing to chew, but, but he was right. Like we, we, he had, he had learned what worked for my voice. We all sort of, you know, in a band, you learn each other and you can have some fun with that. And the nice part about that is if you, if it, if the singer does buy into it, then immediately you've got two band members with buy-in, right. And two people to drive that bus through, which, which is helpful potentially. So, you know, yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. So I have, various feelings about all this. Like I have entirely let the control go. Sure. And I'm dealing with how I feel about that. Yep. Um, I'm, I'm anticipating, you know, that the songs will be hard. And, but, and actually the biggest thing that, that resonates in my mind is once you go down the path of offering someone input and they don't take their input, is that actually more of a negative than never taking it in the first place? <laughs> yes. It is? Fair. No, no, I no. I, it is. No, I'm saying yes to your question. That's a very valid question. Yeah. All right. So what I did was I told the band that we we're going to go through this process. We use Slack. So this is all taking place on Slack. Oh, uh, yep. And I write a little paragraph. I said, yeah. guys, you know, think about a few things. Think about songs that we can knock out, you know, fairly directly in practice. They, you know, not overly complex. Sure. Songs that work for us are generally songs that people know. They're kind of that more upbeat, happy songs, you know, and and I would like to suggest that what's good for our band business wise is keep an eye towards newer material. We have plenty of classic rock and classic soul funk stuff. Sure. Keep an eye on new material. So I I tried to 
steer the usefulness of this exercise into a certain direction. Yeah. So song selections come in and um, I am extremely keenly aware that a lot of what I'm fighting here is I wouldn't have chosen that. And I'm going to set that aside, but I'm, it is, it is forefront in my mind that I shouldn't be too critical or, you know, about this. Like I'm committed to go down this path. I'm committed to see this all through. I'm committed to without drama, which is key. Yeah. Um, you know, you know, take this process, but I do got these little voices in the back of my head saying, uh, you know, like, you know, I got like a not very well-known tower of power song, you know, from one of the horns. I got, you know, a Hendrix song, which is a great song. And, and actually none of the songs submitted were great. Were excuse me, were, were bad songs. I mean, many great songs. Yeah, it's gotta but, be the right um, song for that band. And that, that's the deal is like you open up the opportunity for a democratic song selection process and you get, you get people's tastes, you get people's, you know, creative opinion, which is by definition, a, a flammable point to start. You know, so that, you know you're, you're saying yes or no to someone's creative idea, even though they were forewarned that this is the process we're going through. Yeah. I don't know. So here's the thing here. Here's here's my thoughts on on uh, at this point in in our just our dissection of the process. It's great to acknowledge and I mean, like, I'm going to say something that sounds stupid to acknowledge that we all like different things. Right. And it's totally fine that there's some Bruce Springsteen song that means the world to you and some Rush song that means the world to me that doesn't necessarily resonate with the other guy. Like there's that's that's just a, a fact of being human. We can and have played in the same band together. Like all of those things reconcile totally fine. All, great. In fact, like it, it's 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 awesome. Where, but none of that matters. Like if the song resonates with me, that's nice. If the song resonates with you, that's nice. But we're talking about a practical thing. We are not, if you're, you have to look at what your band's mission is. And for oh, you example, mean goals that I told everybody to write on their ideation board? Yeah, th- those things. <laughs> that's right. But you have to make sure that you're all in sync on those. And, and that's the thing that I think before any, and here's the problem. Once I recommend the song that means a lot to me, or you recommend the song that means a lot to you, potentially, and I, I'm taking our analytical minds out of this, Potentially, we're now emotionally committed to that song being on every set list that we ever do in the prime slot. Right. Uh, And if that doesn't happen, then we're butthurt. Okay, where we can avoid that is before anyone suggests a song. So there's no ability for me to judge you on your song selection or you to judge me on mine. We come up with the ground rules like anybody can suggest anything. But here's. What's what our goal as a band is. Are we a working band? Yes. Okay. What does working mean? Mm -hmm. Playing for appreciative crowds. Okay. What, what can, what do we do? Not what does every band do? What do we do to make our crowds appreciative for your band? I know that means playing songs that people come in the room, likely knowing and killing them, right? Like playing them well, having, uh, but, but killing them can be even further dissected, you know, and I'll talk about the house rockers here, but that's, you know, something with a great horn part, something with a great lead vocalist, right? You know, like the right lead vocalist for that song. And it needs to be a song that is in within the uh, technical abilities of the band. Certainly yeah. there are things that you can, if it's beyond you in some way, you can distill it down potentially and still make the song work. There's nothing wrong with that. But like... Those are important things to to make sure, OK, we got to make sure all these boxes are checked and you can in terms of like one of those boxes, which is songs that people recognize, you can further narrow that down and really come up with a list so that when I bring in my, you know, uh, favorite Rush song that I'm like, ah, oh, we would kill at this. And can you imagine if we did? Uh, you know, this great horn part for closer to the heart, people would go nuts for that. We replaced the temple blocks or the, sorry, the, the chimes with horns. This is going to be freaking amazing. You know, you, you put it through the, the previously agreed upon 
ringer, so to speak. And okay, where do we, ch- what boxes does it check? Well, that song's not really danceable. Okay, well, that, that was definitely one of our criteria. Okay, well, you know, how many people, what percentage of our crowd is going to recognize it and is it going to resonate with? Well, it's a, a more popular Rush song, great, but mm, I don't know. Uh, do we have somebody that can sing it? Oh, well, <laughs> you know, uh, that's interesting, Dave. You know, what were your thoughts on that? You know, and and that way, potentially, you avoid the butthurt of you innately i mean we to be fair to be fair we both innately know i think that closer to the heart would be a bad song for the house rockers to play for a variety of reasons in fact there are more against than four uh but the problem is not everybody in the band is able to put things through that objective judgment tree quickly enough so when when i come in and i suggest closer to the heart then you say dude there's no way like you're not saying that because you like the song or hate the song. You're saying that because objectively, you know that that's a bad idea for that. I'll band. put it this way. I yeah. have, I have in our band three plus four hours of a list stuff. That's that it. I can put any time and it kills all the time. If you're going to suggest something. Does it, does it meet that standard? Not it would be cool or wouldn't it be cool? Yeah. But we basically have, you know, a starting lineup that is, you know, pretty tested, battle tested, works, gets us work. And, you know, I'm going to go back to what you said, which is what is your goals and what is your band's mission? I have a band that wants to work and wants to get paid. Yep. It's not a just a for fun thing for some of the guys. Those things are less, but they like those two things a lot. They like to keep working. And if I if I put closer to the heart in the middle of our set, it would be weird. Right. Probably. And I, I think so. I mean, you never know. That's the thing is there's always wild cards. Right. But, Where, well, but. but what you do know is the stuff that's more likely to do. Like, Correct. For the limited amount of time you have to rehearse. Yep. Right. What are the best decisions you're going to make? And so. Well, and at your standpoint, and, and I, I began asking this question with Fling, too, and you just sort of alluded to it now is. It, but you can be very direct about it. OK, here is the set list that we played last gig. Which song would you take out to put in closer to the heart? Which one is worse for us than that one? And, you know, I wound up uh, in fling at one point saying, OK, let's I want to democratize this because I because I want to, you know, keep everybody engaged and happy. So help me here. Which songs get cut? Because we only have a fixed amount of time to play. We can't play as long as we want. So which song gets cut? You tell me. And now I can float the next best song to the top. And maybe Closer to the Heart is that. Or maybe it's something else that had to be cut because there wasn't enough room for it last gig. So, But my point to all this is that I think many bands get to this point where this discussion goes to incredible shades of gray. Where, Mm -hmm. yes, I want... I, and I've heard all sorts of crazy rationales and I, and I do consider them kind of self-serving rationales. And again, I'm going to say right here and right now, I'm challenged by this whole process. It's making me crazy, sure. but I'm committed to doing it because I promised I would do it. Okay? Right. Of course. Yeah. So, and there's things to learn, this. right? There's things we can all learn. So it's there's not some a things bit. to learn. And there were, and there were some good suggestions that we'll get out of it. Are they, you know, the best suggestions? It's kind of a moot point at this, at this, sure. at this point, but I would say this, I, it's interesting to me. When dealing with creative people who have made it clear that they want, they want to work and they want to get paid well for their work until it comes into play that their creative input, their you know, creative vision, their creativity, um, you know, has to be held up to the light in a certain way. Right, right, right. right. You know, and, and then all of a sudden the, 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 the conversations get very uh, subjective, not objective. They're right. like, and, and I will tell you for me, here's what I feel like as a leader. This is going to sound pretty harsh, but this is what I feel like a leader. I want what I want. Paul, go out and book it. Go find me an audience to play the stuff that satisfies me. That satisfies me. Oh, that's great. Right. Wow. And I mean, that, that's a, that's a great, that's a great, <laughs> that would be a great scenario to be in, uh, to be able to say to someone, uh, hey, you know, here's the stuff I want to play. Go find me a, a venue that's full of, you know, 150 people that want to hear me play that stuff. Go come back when you come back when you've got it booked and I'm I'm there. 
That's right. And the, it's a little ability, unfair, but yeah, yeah. And people kind of dig their heels in because now you're kind of dealing with their worldview and then right. you're dealing with kind of their personal taste. And it is a very dicey thing to jump to, um, to jump to, you know, you know, your, your input isn't, you know, quite good. And so this, you know, does get to that perspective. If, if you're in a band, if your goals are to work and to make money, if you're, you know, this is a financial equation for you. If it's a bunch of guys who are friends who are in it and you're, you, you talked about it and your goals are the same, we just want to have fun. If we can play once or twice a month, you know, get out to the club, you know, have a, have a ball, you know, express a little bit. We're all, let's all take a quarter of the show and express ourselves. If that's your agreed upon goal from the beginning, that's kind of cool. But, and I'm going to actually bring this all the way around. So we played a corporate gig last week. Oh, nice. For a big tech company. Okay. And the attendees of this corporate gig were pretty young. They were, you know, I'd say 25 to 35, pretty much. Sure. The, the more new stuff we did, Bruno Mars, CeeLo, um, even Smash Mouth, you know. That, a, none, of that's, none of that's new other than Bruno Mars, right? CeeLo's yeah. not new, right? I mean, newer. Newish. Newer Newish. than Tower of Power. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and a few of the, like one of the three earth, wind and fire songs they seem to connect with. Um, it, it was pretty sparse though. And, you know, much of the classic rock was harder. I mean, it was hard. Sure. And I have been of, of the opinion again, given the goal we have of continuing to, you know, you know, half the guys in my band make their living from music, right? It's, it, it is important to them. So I've been pushing this agenda. Let's let's find newer music. And, um, you know, like, like we're going to take a stab at that Billie Eilish song, Bad Guy. Uh-huh. And we are having these really interesting conversations like be careful, right? Be careful that you try to do it too close to the original because it's a 17 year old girl doing the original. Right. And, you know, be careful. Right. The, the riffs are great. The song is structurally really interesting. We can do something with that that will be recognizable to people that we can represent it in a, in a reasonably accurate way without, without, you know, trying to be something that we're not. I, I feel that. And I feel that there's a ton of new music that we can actually do that with. But my point to all this is if we want more corporate work and wedding work, where did all this, you know, remember once upon a time, cover bands were called top 40 bands, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, I think you you have to really look at that really hard. And I put it out to the band and said, are you guys sure we want to go through this? Again, I'm committed to I'm, I've I've re- I've dropped the kimono. Yep. It, it, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm simply pointing out, I believe the best business decision for the band is this. I have guys in the band who are not full time musicians who are like, who I'm sure are like, nope. I, I'm, I'm good, you know, doing the stuff that I, that I love listening to and I want to play with. I have guys in the band who probably don't know anything that's on the, on the radio right now. And so right. they don't have anything to contribute to that, to that conversation. And I totally get that. The question is right there at that mushy spot of what's business best for the band versus what's just creatively best for all the people in the band. So here's, and, here's an interesting sort of twist on this. Cause I, I'm trying to give people questions that they, they can ask of themselves or their bands to, to sort of address this. Right. And, and one of them was, which song would you drop? Right. Like that. I think I, hopefully that's helpful for somebody out there. Uh, Cause it took me a long time to get there. The next yeah. one is who is, well, let me ask, I, I, I'll, I'll be a little coy and, and beat around the bush a little bit here. But who's the best uh, bass player in your band, right? Then if you answer that question. That's the person that should be playing bass. <laughs> who's the best person to uh, play the trumpet? Okay, that's the person who should be playing trumpet, right? I mean, you just go around, and 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 that those conversations are easy, right? Now, at the beginning, you asked and answered the question: Who's the best person to be choosing the songs that we play? Who's the best person to be building the set list? Who's the best person to run the show on stage and, and, you know, ensure the flow and entertainment and all of that is happening. And there are times, you know, in most bands, but actually it's been true that uh, not all uh, in most bands, I'm the best drummer in the band. Right. You know, uh, but that doesn't mean that I don't make mistakes and I don't have a bad night on the drums. Sometimes, you know, I'm not always, uh, I don't always play at the same level, right? You know, there, there are those moments, which also means 
that the person who is the best at selecting songs isn't necessarily going to be flawless at that. There are going to be things that are that are wrong and, and you realize and and the same true for the person that's running the show. Sometimes, you know, you just don't have it that night and things are a little tough to get moving. And, and it's just how it goes. Right. The best front person. Same kind of thing. But you you don't replace them after one gig where it went bad and. Uh, not that things went bad with, you know, you being the only one selecting songs. In fact, it sounds like they went fairly well. Uh, but you, you, it's worth sitting the band down and just being functional about this. Like, where do we want to put all our time and energy? The, who's the best person to book the band? Then that's the person booking the band. Who's the best person to run the band's finances? That's the person that runs the right. Like there's a division of labor here and selecting songs is but one piece in a very big uh, machine that happens and maybe it's okay that not every, if everybody's goals about the band are the same and, and you sort of address that maybe that's not the case, but if everybody's goals for the band are the same, then it should be easier to, uh, to relinquish song selection uh, to one person. And maybe that person is, you know, just like the person who books the gigs, you, you can provide feedback to that person. Like, Hey, you know, that one club, the load in there sucks. I mean, you got to be careful about all of, you know, how upset you get about those sorts of things. But there are some legitimate things where it's like, I don't think that was worth it. OK, have that discussion, but defer the ultimate decision to the person that you've sort of assigned to be that. Right. Like that's the person that, that books our gigs. And, you know, we've ex expressed our concerns. And, and there you go. Same with song selection. Hey, I think it'd be cool to do this song. I think it'd be cool to do that song. And, and then that's and then just let them do it. If your goal is to be a working functional band, you kind of have to think about it like a business. Uh, not always easy. It's not always easy when it's a business that's not a band. I will tell you that from experience. In fact, sometimes it's much worse. Uh, sometimes bands are the easiest business I work in. But, mm. um, but that's one way to look at it, right? Is who's the best person to select songs. And sometimes that means acknowledging that, that you are the worst person or the not best person to select songs. And, you know, there you go. I kind of look at it through the lens of like my fear. Like I've done many, many, many decisions in the interest, like I shared in the beginning of keeping the band moving forward, letting go of some of my own creative control in the interest of keeping a cohesive unit. Sure. And by and large that has worked, right? I have right. mostly the same guys I played with for years. Right. Yeah. Case. I would point. say that, yeah. you know, here's the interesting reflection. If I took all these selections, Made everybody happy. Yep. Just, you know, the, the go out to the edge of, of this reasoning. I don't think we would be that bookable a band. And then some of those guys would leave and right. then be back to the, right? right? So, you know, you're kind of like, who's left holding the bag as a result of someone else's creative, you know, uh, yeah. desire for creative input. Yeah. And that's kind of, you know, the thing. And then, you know, everybody has, everybody has some leverage in these things. If, if a musician doesn't like what's going on, they're going to leave. Right. Right. So I try to make it as good a place as possible where people want to stay. But you know, this, this one, this one hits pretty close to home, right? This one just feels like, again, I have the fear that I've opened the door and asked for input, but I'm not taking 90% of the input that was offered. Are yeah. people going to be like, well, that was a stupid exercise. Why don't we know what I waste my time? Well, that can be right? a bad thing, right? If you, if, if it, if it seems insincere, even though in your case, it, it, I, I know that it wasn't, you've explained that here too, but it, it was sincere, but, but also, you know, you do have, you have a lot of experience selecting songs and people don't know all the songs that you have decided not to like, you you consider lots of different songs for the band and you don't tell everybody everything you consider. You tell people the ones that you're going to do right. The ones that made it through all those filters. People I don't try. necessarily see it that way. People see, oh, yeah. Paul's just picking his favorite songs. He gets everything he wants. Right. He gets everything he wants. And that's not true. Um, it's just not transparent. Uh, and and there's a difference there, you know, but perception is reality. So we kind of have to address that. Yeah. I will leave this conversation in this one place that some of the people that are the most fervent about wanting to get booked more and make more have the strongest opinions about doing kind of what I would call vanity outlier yeah. songs because it satisfies their creative. It is a very, 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 very difficult conversation yep. because, you know, obviously you want to, you know, if music is your living, but as soon as, as soon as the implication 
that someone's creativity is going to be stifled gets very emotional. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's the thing is, is, is there's an emotional attachment here and, and it's tough. Yeah. 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 I know. I know. It's not fun, but it's part of it. <laughs> and, and you've got to deal with it. So I, I think it, certainly it can be a democratic process as long as everyone a is on the same page with what the end result needs to be. And B is, is, um, willing to admit and be aware of their strengths and weaknesses in, in the realm of selecting songs. But um, see, Dave, that's, that's what I'm thinking is almost impossible. Right. I, and this is why I don't, I can be a good soldier. If someone hires me to be a sideman for a gig, I say nothing. I show up, I play my parts. I sure. get it because yep. I'm a leader on the other side. Yep. And I don't, you know, as a leader, I struggle a lot with, you know, the areas of gray because to me, it's pretty black and white. I'm yeah. doing all the work, you know, and, and that's kind of how I feel. And I'm responsible for it. Right? Yeah, right. But, you know, that whole like, no, this song is really good. It really means a lot to me. Go out and sell us a gig that I can play this, you know, uh, on just feels challenging to me on a constant basis. Well, it's so tough. I, I would it's say, tough. yeah, it is tough. And I, and I would say, again, this is, this is, um, you know, even in those situations where you talk, you know, you describe these democratic situations, but we've all talked about the reality that even in democratic situations, they're not democratic situations because no. you always have the guy who doesn't speak up. You always have the guy who dom you know, dominates the room yeah. and, you know, they're not democratic situations. And, you know, there's the guy who just wants to be in a band and, you know, tell me where to be and I'll plug in. And then there's the guy who, no, but my creative vision is so brilliant. You know, everybody follow me, but someone else do the work. And, you know, so I, I, and it's I not binary. Still, it's not binary either because I'll, I, I've certainly, you know, I mean, I'm, I am easily able to be one of those people that dominates the conversation. I mean, I literally just interrupted you. Right. So, uh, <laughs> completely comfortable, no problem. Uh, but, uh, and, and you're the same way, right? Like we, we both are easily able to be that person. But when I'm a side man, I get it. I show up and I do my thing. But it doesn't always stay that way. If I'm playing in the same band over and over again and the, the idea of side man sort of gets blurred or like in Uptown, I am most definitely not the leader. Who chooses of that the band. songs for Uptown? Gary does. Um, That's it. Leader but does it. You know, you he show does, up, but, play them, and you get paid. Well, yes, yes, for sure. But there's a conversation that happens. Gary is the ultimate, you know, he's the one that decides whether we're going to try to learn a song or not. That's it. And then once we've learned it, whether or not it makes it to the set list is 100% up to him. Mm. Um, but... It's not quite that black and white, right? Like, you know, if there's a song we don't like, we'll tell him like, eh, I don't know, man, you know, this isn't working. Or if there's songs that somebody feels really, you know, passionate about, they'll suggest them. But the the, the filter is Gary. If he doesn't so I'll, I'll tell you what believe I think that it's going to work, it doesn't it doesn't even happen. Right. I get it. So I'll, I'll tell you what I, I'll take from this. And this is a this is, again, a, a lessons for leaders thing. Yeah. One be very clear because this is a, a potentially inflammable thing. Yep. Number two, develop the skill to take input with a smile. And if, you know, if you're not sincere, even if you're not sincere, get really good at appearing sincere of, you know, you know, considering, you know, hopefully, you know, you're empathetic and, you know, you can take it and say, let me, let me think about it, but be, but, you know, make people feel heard. That would be sure. number two. People want to be heard. It, and that's, be heard. The, that's the difference. Like with Gary, I know he hears me when I tell him we should be doing X. Uh, I also understand there are a lot of reasons why any given person might choose not to approach a song. And one of those might be that he might look at the guitar part for that particular song and say, oh, dude, there's I can't I can't deliver that. I don't care yeah. if these other guys can. I can't. So yeah. it's off the list. And and that has nothing to do with me or my, you know, my, my emotions or anything like that. It's just a practical decision. And uh, and, and there it is. You know, it's, and, yep. and I could choose to say, hey, you know, I don't like this. I'm going to go move on. And he'd be like, all right, sounds good. Thanks, man. You know, I mean, we'd still be we, we could be friendly unless we made the departure not friendly. But, you know, it's just like it's business. In that band, it's 100 percent business. We had fun together. It, we, you know, certainly can hang out and talk and, and you know, be friendly and f even friends. But mm -hmm. it's not about that. 
It's yeah. what what is the what is the mission of this band? And everybody knows it. So you're right. Clarity is the key there. Yep. And I think writing down some of the, you know, the 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 way that the leader makes makes decisions about song selection, I think, is a good thing to share. I agree. You know, are we a top 40 band? Are we only a classic rock band? You know, you know, I, you know, some of being a leader is is the ability to effectively sell your ideas, right? You want to keep everybody on the same page. Absolutely. You want to change the course, you got to sell your ideas to the band, you know, and comfort zones you know, need to be taken care of. So that would be the other thing. But I would say that my lesson is be really, 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 really careful in how you kind of loosen your, and, and give up the control. If you want the control, it is, you have to work at keeping the control. If you don't, you know, if you don't care about the control, then you know you dole it out as you see fit. But I would say my lesson is that I went from I have a vision creatively for the band to you know guys want to come in and they want to feel something when they sing and they you know in order to you know get their emotional commitment to you know I'd like some creative expression and you know the 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 circle keeps getting wider as to you know a condition of people playing in the band and that's a that's a slippery slope for all people involved. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, there you go. Let us know what you think. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. Tom, thank you for the question. You drove us into a 30 plus minute conversation here, which <laughs> I think is great. Uh, thanks to everybody who listens. Uh, thanks again to uh, the professor, Mr. Neil Peart, for uh, for all the lessons that he's left for all of us. And, uh, and really, thanks to everybody for everything. It's uh, it's good stuff. Of course, I have let's to have a good let's have a good 2020 day. Yeah, let's have a good 2020. I'm into that, man. Yeah, folks, there you go. Off we go. Hey, uh, fall 2020. Is there one thing that, that that you could like one piece of advice you could give to all of us, Paul? I would say always be performing. Oh, I love it. 